Over the past few years, the film Coraline has become quite popular across the internet, primarily due to a spike in videos and articles containing theories, including my own, that analyze every little bit of it. At first I assumed it was unique for this movie to be my favorite, but after seeing how many people agree with this notion, I decided to finally look further into it. So today, I dissect every aspect of Coraline to find out what exactly makes the film so good. Hey everyone! On the surface, Coraline honestly doesn't seem like an interesting movie. The whole film takes place in basically two settings, and the concept itself is not that creative when you think about it. Neil Gaiman himself has even compared it to the story of Hansel and Gretel, which it essentially is, just told in a different way. Innocent children are unhappy with their lives and get lured in by monsters who pretend to have worlds where everything's better. It's a lesson that we've all heard, seen, and been told many, many times, and yet it feels different in Coraline. So why is this the case? One of the biggest reasons why people love this movie so much is the mystery behind the main antagonist, the other mother. When separating so-so villains from really good villains, how much is known about them is an extremely important factor. Think about how much more interesting Voldemort became when his past had to be extracted, or sticking with Laika, why the two sisters from Kubo and the Two Strings inspire so much fear. Not knowing the complete backstory of characters, especially villains, makes films more intricate and enticing as viewers strive to find out information like this. This is emphasized in Coraline as we barely know anything about how the Beldam became who she is, and in fact, what she really is at all. All we get from the movie are a few lines from the cat and the ghost children, but even those are purposely vague to draw the viewer in even further. It's the main reason why so many theories have been drawn up, as secrecy naturally leads to exploration. And expanding on this idea, the fact that the film takes place in virtually two settings results in even more intrigue and popularity. It seems pretty counterintuitive, as wouldn't a very limited setting get boring? But that's not the case in Coraline. History tends to get more interesting as it's zoomed in on something, and in this case, it's zoomed in on the Pink Palace. Aside from the short scene in town, the whole movie takes place in or around this house, and the house itself, the grounds, and the people who have lived in it all draw levels of secrecy. In the beginning, Coraline can't go anywhere without hearing something out of the ordinary. YB tells her that children aren't supposed to be allowed to move into the Pink Palace, Babinski's mice let her know that she shouldn't go through the door, and Spink and Forceful give her tea leaves that correctly foreshadow the scenes ahead. It's all done to lure the viewer in. It wouldn't be as interesting if there was a broader setting, but because the film is centered around just the Pink Palace, everyone is dying to find out what really is going on in this one small supernatural area. This is further extrapolated by the two different sides of the movie, the real world and the other world. It allows us to become even more familiar with the setting, and to explore the house and grounds in both worlds. Because the setting is so small, it allows the viewer to notice the differences in detail between the two worlds, such as the portraits of the ghost children in the dining room, or the way the other Babinski acts compared to the real Babinski. But this point is even further driven by what I think is the most important reason why people seem to get attached to Coraline, the music and visuals. I guarantee that the film would receive a much poorer rating if Bruno Coulet's fabulous soundtrack was taken out, and all that was left were visuals and dialogue. Of course, this is the case with many movies, but here, the dark, mystical sounds totally set the tone for the action. What's funny is that the rock band, They Might Be Giants, was originally supposed to do the whole soundtrack, but the directors decided to make the movie darker, and all of the songs were cut out except for the other father song. Thank goodness this occurred, because Coulet's music transforms the film from good to fantastic, even though it's not conscious to the audience. The soundtrack is simply the audio of mystery and intrigue, which totally enhances the plot. Maybe just as crucial, though, are the amazing stop-motion visuals put together by Laika. They completely serve the purpose of differentiating the real world from the other world by using color and spacing to create huge contrast. While the real world is grey, dull, and cramped, the other world has color, space, and brightness to it, or at least in the beginning. You don't even realize how drab everything is until Coraline goes to the other world for the first time, and the contrast is apparent. It's perfect for establishing the Hansel and Gretel concept of going from a boring world to an interesting one, which is also why the movie is such a success. 
It's the mystery and secrecy, hidden backstories and limited setting, and music and visuals that make Coraline such a great movie. But anyway, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe by clicking the light bulb logo in the center of the screen. Tell me which aspects of the film make you love Coraline in the comment section. See you later. Thank you.